Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Gradient Podcast. We interview various people who research, build, use, or think about AI, including academics, engineers, artists, entrepreneurs, and more. I am your host, Daniel Bashir. Today's guest is Professor Melanie Mitchell. Professor Mitchell is the Davis Professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Her research focuses on conceptual abstraction, analogy making, and visual recognition in AI systems. She is the author or editor of six books, and her work spans the fields of AI, cognitive science, and complex systems. Her latest book is Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. This was a really wonderful and in-depth discussion. There were a lot of different avenues to go into, from the fallacies that both the field and journalists tend to make in discussing artificial intelligence, to some of the ways we think about the word intelligence and what that represents in the first place. I thought Professor Mitchell had some really insightful things to say here, and I hope you take away as much from this episode as I did. As always, if you aren't already subscribed to The Gradient, go ahead and follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can also follow us on Substack, where you'll get notifications whenever we release a new podcast episode, article, or newsletter. And now, without further ado, Melanie Mitchell. Melanie, you're an incredibly important voice in some of the contemporary debates about where AI as a field needs to go and how we approach this problem of intelligence more broadly. And so I'd love to get back to where it all started for you. How did you get into AI in the first place? Well, uh, right after um, I graduated from college, I read Douglas Hofstadter's book, Gertel Escherbach, An Eternal Golden Braid, which uh, probably a lot of the listeners here have read or maybe at least own. I don't know how much they've read. It's a long book. But I was incredibly inspired by the ideas in that book. Um, I came out of college as a mathematics major, so I was really excited about the uh, mathematics part of it. I also was really uh, into music, so especially um, Baroque and classical music. So the part about Bach was really exciting to me. And in particular, you know, the ideas about AI, which I knew absolutely nothing about at the time. So I actually uh, approached Hofstadter first by writing to him, which I didn't hear back. <laughs> oh. uh, and then I ha happened to be in Boston when he was at MIT on a sabbatical, and I managed to get in touch with him and ask him if I could join his research group. And he finally agreed, and I worked for him for a summer. He was going to the University of Michigan after that, so I applied to a uh, University of Michi Michigan Computer Science Department. I had never actually taken a computer science class. <laughs> Although I took a few uh, after, you know, between that and starting grad school. And uh, that's, that's what happened. I ended up going to University of Michigan and getting my PhD with Hofstetter. That's, I guess it's kind of interesting just to contrast. I've spoken to a number of people who seem to have very different backgrounds getting into AI. And it feels to me like that definitely influences some of the sides they take and the contemporary debates we're having over how do you get to this thing we call intelligence? What exactly does it mean? And so I'd love to hear a little bit about how that not having a CS background when you first started working with Hofstadter and getting into AI and perhaps your, your work with them as well influenced some of the commitments you have today about what intelligence is and then how we ought to go about getting there. Yeah, so Hofstetter also didn't have a computer science background. He has a PhD in physics and never really saw himself as a computer scientist. And in fact, at Michigan, he was in the psychology department, interestingly. And while I was in computer science, our offices were all in psychology. So we spent our time hanging out with the 
psychology faculty and grad students. I think um, at least my interest and, and the interest of other people in our group was more on the side of how do we understand intelligence more broadly than individual human intelligence, or how do we understand what is the nature of understanding of being able to make analogies, that was really the focus, and so on, rather than any kind of desire to build, say, AI systems for a particular application. So it's much more basic research, much more inspired by what's now called cognitive science. And I think that made the research very different from what a lot of other people in AI were doing. Yeah, I can see how there's there's a contrast there, because whenever I hear people with a very heavy computer science background talk about this, they're always like, well, if I want to understand intelligence, the best thing to do is to actually build it. And then I can understand what it is that I just built. And so coming from a more basic research perspective, it's like, well, we should really understand the fundamentals. Like, let's define what we're talking about first and then set about perhaps building it if we want to do that. Yeah, I think that it's it's a difference. And it's also, I think a lot of people in AI want to build something that acts intelligently, but don't have kind of a deep desire to understand necessarily how it does it. You know, maybe you apply your deep neural network to some problem and it does great, but how does it do it? You know, that you don't see so much a focus on understanding mechanisms that that you see in you know in psychology which is all about that. Right. One thing I wonder about because I think that the kind of seeds of some of the debates we're having today really began long ago with the connectionists to different camps. What did those debates look like when you were just getting started in the field when you were working with Hostetter? Those debates are very similar to the kinds of debates we're having today. <laughs> you know, that the, the question, there, this whole s- s- symbolic AI versus machine learning or, you know, sub-symbolic AI um, was at the forefront back then, as it is uh, today. You know, this was, I got my PhD in 1990, so it was both a lot of work on people doing symbolic stuff versus also a lot of the, what was called then uh, PDP, parallel distributed processing and connectionism and all of that was very big. So there was those debates. There was also the debates were ha- like we're having today on innateness versus learning, sort of how much should be built into a system versus how much should be learned end to end. Just all these debates never change. The people having them change, but the debates stay the same. Yeah. And I suppose another aspect of it, just as a people change, perhaps the backgrounds, the prior commitments of the people change. Do you feel like there's been any change in terms of the sophistication of the debates, like the backgrounds people are bringing to them, whether the ideas there have they, do you feel like they've really evolved in a significant way? Or do you feel like we're just kind of saying the same things back and forth? (laughs) In some cases, we're saying the same things. Uh, In some cases, I think they've evolved. You know, I think um, back back then there are a lot of things just that the, the questions about statistical machine learning, it was just kind of getting started. And a lot of people never thought that it would achieve the kinds of things that it has achieved. You know, no one thought that speech recognition would be essentially solved, at least to some extent, by statistical learning. Nobody thought that language processing would get as far as it did without building in structures of grammar and syntax and all of that. So I think a lot of people were quite surprised at how powerful sort of this massive data-driven statistical learning has become. I've definitely been surprised. But I also think that that impressive success has influenced a lot of people to interpolate sort of how far scaling can actually go just in terms of data and model size and all of that. So I think that that debate is is new, that debate about scaling, you know, whether scaling will take us 
to the next big step in AI progress or whether it's going to hit a hit a dead end at some point. Right. I suppose that it's really only been the past decade or so where we've seen there be enough data and compute in order to allow researchers to leverage. Let's actually do experiments in terms of what scaling laws look like and then sort of figure out, well, we now have these emergent capabilities once I have a model with 100 billion, 200 billion parameters, or I train it on so much data. And so there's, I, I suppose a big aspect of it is that now we can we can lend some empirical weight, I think, to some of these questions that maybe we couldn't before. To some extent, yes. Although I'm not sure we have the right metrics for this empirical study. So when we look, you look at language models and how do we evaluate them? How do we say that we're making progress? Well, there's a few different ways. One is that we look at measures like perplexity, you know, information theoretic kinds of measures about the distribution that's being learned. We also look at benchmark data sets. And one of the things that we've seen is that some of these benchmark data sets are flawed in terms of both allowing statistical shortcuts that um, enable a system to do well on these benchmarks without having the real ability that the benchmark is trying to measure. You know, you see this with things like the general language understanding evaluation, the glue and the super glue language benchmarks, that they have a lot of problems that humans, you know, are subtle things that humans would never pick up on because humans are using their understanding of language to answer the questions. But these systems that have enormous amounts of capacity for learning correlations can pick up on. And so I think that when we talk about progress in, say, natural language understanding or, or even in, in other, other areas of AI, you know, we, we don't quite have the right benchmarks to assess that. And that's one of the reasons that these systems are really impressive when you interact with them, but they ha haven't yet made the jump in many cases to being actually used in the real world because they're too brittle. Yeah, I think there's that aspect of these benchmarks probably started as this is an easier proxy, something we can measure. And that's not exactly the goal itself. But then at some point, the proxy becomes the goal. And then what you're chasing after really isn't good. And that makes me think of things like the Chinese room argument or philosophical zombies, where you've got this aspect of, well, externally, this thing that I'm looking at, it seems to display intelligence, it seems to be able to do translation. And so the outcomes are perhaps what I expect. And that's really interesting. But mechanistically, we're still not at a place where we have at all a, a good understanding of what's going on inside, just as you were saying earlier. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a little bit of difference with the, the Chinese room and the zombies and all of that, um, sure. where the underlying assumption there is that they actually do have human like performance, that they don't, they aren't brittle. Right. And yet they're they're using some kind of non-human like mechanisms, whereas we haven't gotten to that point yet with AI systems, of course. But you're right that, that there is that problem that it's hard to look under the hood and say, how exactly is this doing the task? You look at something like a language model like GPT-3 or something that can do these so-called reasoning tasks. But are they actually doing reasoning in the sense that we would assume, you know, if I know if I tested you for reasoning and I saw that you were really good at reasoning, I, I would make some assumptions about how you could generalize. And it may be that these those assumptions don't hold for these systems because they're not doing human like reasoning. Yeah, I, I suppose when we look at modern language models, it becomes pretty clear they don't seem to display these qualities of, of things like common sense and this very basic sort of prior knowledge that we might expect. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. And some of your work has talked about some of this. I'd love to spend a bit of time on your work, why AI is harder than we think. I think one of the key things you discussed in there was these, these four fallacies we tend to make when discussing artificial intelligence. 
Could you give maybe just to start with a, a rundown of what those are? Yeah. So what I was responding to in that paper was a lot of what I thought was over-optimism about how close we are to human level intelligence, which is a concept that we don't really have a good definition of. But I saw four, at least four fallacies, none of which are new per se, but I thought they were very important to why people were so optimistic. One was what's called the first step fallacy. This was, I think, first described by the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus back in the, the 1980s. This was the fallacy that any time we make progress on some narrow task, that counts as progress on general AI. So think about Deep Blue beating Kasparov at chess or AlphaGo beating the best Go players, you know, Lisa Dole and others. A lot of people interpreted those huge steps as progress in general AI. But of course, the techniques of Deep Blue, the sort of brute force search, did not extend to other domains. You know, it remains to be seen if something like deep reinforcement learning, the AlphaGo variety can extend to anything besides games. Some of those techniques have been useful in other domains, but it's not clear that there this is this continuous path we're on towards general AI. Dreyfus himself said there's a discontinuity, which he said was common sense. <laughs> so I guess we'll talk about that later on. The second fallacy was the idea that what I called easy things are easy and hard things are hard, which is the fallacy that if something's easy for humans, it should be easy for AI and vice versa. So something like Go, playing Go at the uh, highest level is very hard for humans, but it's not the hardest thing for AI systems. I like the example that Gary Marcus had in one of his papers that playing charades, which any six-year-old can do, is way beyond any current AI right now because it involves so much sort of social knowledge and theory of mind and language and all of that. So that's an easy thing for us, but still much harder for AI than Go. And the easy things, you know, thing, things that we look at in children as the easiest things, like just having co general common sense, turns out to be a grand challenge for AI. DARPA, the DOD research funding agency, has set up as a grand challenge an AI system, getting an AI system that has the common sense of an 18 month old baby. We often think that the things that we do so easily are going to also be easier for AI. So that's a source of over optimism. The third fallacy was what I called the lure of wishful mnemonics, which is a term due to uh, Drew McDermott. A wishful mnemonic is using a term that is sort of anthropomorphic to describe an AI system. So if we say that, for instance, IBM's Watson program understands natural language, one of the things they said is, uh, you know, it, it can read all of the medical texts in the world in seconds. Okay, so read, that word, implies something when we're using it in the human sense, you know, that when I say, oh, you, you know, I read such and such a book, you assume that I understood what I read. And that's not what Watson is doing, at least not in the same way we are. So it's using these terms to um, describe what machines have done when actually they aren't doing that thing. They're doing something quite different. And the fourth fallacy was intelligence is all in the brain. That's the uh, embodiment issue, the question of whether mimicking our brains is enough to capture intelligence. And I think a lot of people in cognitive science would argue that our bodies and our interactions, physical interactions with the environment, our social interactions and all of that are absolutely essential for capturing intelligence. And this is not something that AI is focusing a lot, a lot on. Yeah, there's a lot to that last one, especially, but I think the, the second fallacy you pointed out, easy things are easy and hard things are hard, strikes me because there's this aspect of, well, we are comparing two very different things fundamentally here. I, a human, have certain aspects to, to my cognition, to the way I engage with the world. 
I have a certain amount of, of working memory, perhaps you might call it, whereas a computer is on a completely different footing with regard to that. And I think we, we don't even need to look to AI to think about some of these things, right? Like if you ask me to do seven digit multiplication in my head, that's very difficult, but I can just have a Python program spit out the answer to pretty much anything I could ask in that regard very quickly. And so I think even before we start thinking about these AI systems themselves, there is a big difference between the the human and the computer. And so it's interesting, maybe it just has to do with the aspirations people have, just in terms of like why these comparisons seem to get made one to one. But it just strikes me as very interesting when it's like we've got two very separate things to begin with. Yeah, for sure. So we all know that machines are much better at arithmetic than humans and that, you know, they have all kinds of different abilities. But if you're trying to capture human-like intelligence, which is generally what people are doing in AI, especially if you're using your own subjective experience of having intelligence, there are certain things that just seem immediate to you that don't seem hard at all. You know, like we're having this conversation or I'm looking at you and I could tell like that it's daytime because I see sunlight and you're wearing a sweater. So it must be kind of cold inside and all kinds of things. Uh, I can tell you're at home and these these things um, are immediate to us. And so there was a sort of there's sort of an assumption that this how hard could this be to capture these things? And this this was sort of at the beginning of the AI enterprise, even back at the original Dartmouth conference that really kicked off the field, there was this idea that, you know, they'd be able to capture all of this kind of common sense, human-like immediate perception very quickly. You know, there's this famous anecdote where Marvin Minsky and others assigned computer vision basically as a summer project to an undergraduate at MIT. (laughs) The the project was to uh, put a camera, you know, have a computer connected to a camera and then describe what it saw in natural language. (laughs) It turned out to be harder. Much harder. But it's so immediate to people, we we kind of assume that it's not going to be that hard for machines. So that's kind of a fallacy. I think one aspect of that fallacy too, as you were kind of pointing out earlier, is this aspect of, of subjective experience. Like if we look at, I guess Thomas Nagel kind of said this, and what is it like to be a bat? I just can't know what it's like to have the subjective experience of something that is totally different from myself. And one thing that often makes me think about is there do seem to be some people who are going in the direction of the systems we're trying to create, these intelligent systems are something very fundamentally different from humans. So should the goal really be to replicate human-like intelligence or do we want to go after something totally different? Do we want to re- define what our goals are in the field in the first place and maybe look at human augmentation. How do you think about some of those questions? AI people have a lot of different goals in mind and it's not like a unified thing where everybody has the same goals. I think the original goals of the field were really to capture human-like intelligence. But there's obviously a lot of benefit in non-human-like intelligence. We see that with some of these efforts to apply AI to scientific discovery, where, like, for instance, the AlphaFold program was able to, because it's so different from the way humans work, it was able to find really interesting patterns and useful for prediction patterns in uh, protein uh, sequences. That's a clear intelligence augmentation result. On the other hand, if we want AI systems to work in the human kind of social world, the human physical world where they're interacting with humans, like say a self-driving car, we don't want them to think very differently from us. That would result in disaster as it has in some cases, if they perceive the world in a different way than we perceive it, because that world is a world of human concepts. So I think it really depends on what you want your AI system to do. That makes a lot of sense. I think we've been skirting around the elephant in the room as far as the question goes, but just to kind of go straight at it, how do you think about the question of of what intelligence is in the first place? I think it's a, you know, maybe the word itself is too broad to be 
very useful. You know, we, we talk about it in so many different ways. So, you know, we talk about intelligence as being on a scale, like an IQ scale, or we talk about, you know, different kinds of intelligences, like the intelligence of humans versus say the intelligence of octopus, which is a very different niche, right? That it's, it's succeeding in its niche through its kind of intelligence. And we talk about AI systems as having kind of intelligence. You know, we have my GPS navigator on my phone is quite intelligent. It can figure out which route I should take because it has a lot of information and a lot of ability for optimization that I don't have. So I don't know. I th- you know, intelligence might just be the thing that's holding us back, that, that terminology. I think it was interesting that in the history of AI, at, like at the Dartmouth meeting, there was a lot of argument about what the field should be called. John McCarthy, who coined the term artificial intelligence, was trying to fi- figure out a way to distinguish AI, what's now called AI, from neural networks which is another field that was called self-organizing networks. And he wanted, you know, he said, this is, these are going to be two different things. So that's why we're calling it AI. And, uh, you know, now it's all been brought together again. But Herbert Simon wanted to call it complex information processing. So to get away from this idea that we're trying to mimic human intelligence. So there's all, you know, I think words matter. And, and it may be that that word has push the field in certain ways that it's hard to get out of. And I think intelligence is hard to define just because it has so many different meanings. And we really have to use adjectives now to talk about it. That's a really fascinating insight because I also know in the past, you've kind of said that there are degrees and a goal directedness to whatever it is we call intelligence. And when I was thinking about that, I wonder if that opens the box to a kind of panpsychism of like everything (laughs) has some degree of intelligence, just like some people might believe everything has some degree of consciousness. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's totally true. You know, I think, you know, intelligence, if we define it extremely broadly as being able to, to have goals and to achieve them, every living thing has intelligence to some degree because evolution gives the goal of, of of surviving and procreating and so on. And therefore, it, it every evolved system has some way of achieving its goals. But of course, that's such a broad definition. It's not super useful for saying whether a GPT-3 has intelligence or not, or has a goal or anything like that. So this gets into a big philosophical discussion. But you know, a lot of people in AI talk about intelligence as the, you know, the capacity to achieve one's goals. But how do, where do those goals come from? You know, how, how do these goals get into these systems? There's this idea that, you know, I think there's a big difference between like me having a goal, whatever goals I have, being a living system, and something like AlphaGo having a goal. I think those are two different uses of the word, and we we conflate them, which makes it hard to talk about sort of what this intelligence is in these systems. Yeah, it's certainly it certainly feels like we have maybe a scripted, or when I say we, I mean people who believe intelligence is a thing that you just said. There's that kind of scripted definition, and then the words kind of get messed together. Another thing that you made me think about was you were mentioning earlier how it seems like we have this collection of observations about things and the terminology becomes difficult. We've kind of slapped this label intelligence on a whole range of things. And that makes me think about how there might be some benefit to really questioning the use of that term in the first place and then defining what we're looking for in a more granular level. That makes me think of the empiricists who are kind of looking at, well, do we have a self? Like, what is this thing that we're claiming kind of exists over and above the various sense impressions that I seem to have in the world? And so my mind is kind of going into the parallel question about this thing we call intelligence. Like, is it, is it even useful to slap that label? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. When I see people make predictions like, oh, we're going to have human level intelligence by 2040 in AI, 
I, I think it's a problem because the target isn't well-defined. What is this human level intelligence you're called? What are the criteria for it? And if you talk about being able to do any cognitive, quote unquote, task that a human can do, what does that even include? I don't think we have a clear sense of the target. I think a lot of people have the faith that we'll know it when we see it, but I'm not so convinced because I think a lot of the things that underlie our intelligence that are subconscious and that we d we're barely even aware of are a huge part of it that we don't necessarily think of as being sort of key to intelligence. We, a lot of people think we can kind of sift it off our brains and put it in computers without looking carefully at all the social, physical, cultural, and other processes that are, it's grounded in. Yeah, it's very difficult to articulate the set of things that are going on there. In your fourth fallacy, you have this sympathy to the idea that we need some sort of embodiment, perhaps even going beyond that, social aspects of the way in which intelligence is developed. And I, I just wonder, have you recontextualized those thoughts in light of some of the recent advances we've been seeing? So we discussed language models, but then we've also been seeing these text-to-image models. And when I, when I spoke to Francois Cholet earlier, I think that the picture he gave of this is, well, this just happens to be a problem space that deep neural nets are going to be very good at in terms of manifolds and something that we can deal with mathematically. Yeah, I, I think it's, again, it's surprising how, how much statistical learning can accomplish given enough data. But you can still see aspects of brittleness in these systems that, that show that they haven't really grasped sort of the semantics of the images that they're creating. There's been a lot of probing of these systems and looking at sort of problems they have with physical reasoning. Like if you ask a system to um, order blocks, like put a yellow block on top of a green block on top of a blue block, they can't do it. And if you ask them to create a, uh, an image that doesn't have something, like I tried like a fruit bowl with no apples, cannot do it. Just because those kinds of basic concepts have, are not, it can't get that from its training data and its correlations. So I think that's, you know, these these failure modes are, are interesting because they show what the systems, these, these statistical algorithms are able to capture and what I don't think they are. It, it sort of remains to be seen sort of how much scaling will, will help. But I, I think that there's something about, you know, our human experience of interacting with the physical world that these systems don't have, and therefore they're never going to get to the kind of semantic abilities that, that people have. That's, a, you know, not necessarily a generally held view, but I believe that. Yeah, I, I do think that makes a lot of sense. There is something about the text to image systems. And I do think that people were making quite a big deal over them. And to the, the wishful mnemonics, it felt like there was a lot of discourse around these models seem to understand more about language than I previously expected, because I can give Dolly or Imogen this input of a kangaroo holding a sign and it can actually give me this very photorealistic image. And so that is taken in some discourse to be to be understanding of what language is and understanding of how the world looks. But when it comes to embodiment, to what you're saying, there's an aspect of actually being able to interact with the world and make modifications. And I guess this also kind of gets into causality. Like I can intervene on the world around me. I can make changes. I can form hypotheses, examine what happens. And that gives me really a picture of what does the causal structure of the world around me look like, perhaps? Yeah, I think there's been arguments over whether these generative models are able to learn causality in some way. Some people have argued that they have some notion of causality, but clearly they don't have they don't have the capacities that that we have, even young children. They're associating text with uh, configurations of pixels and embeddings of, of those two things. I don't think that they are developing causal models of the world. Whether something like that could, you know, by some other 
learning method or other kind of data? You know, that I think is an open question. Yeah, I do very much read it as this active association as well. I think in some of this discussion, we've been getting mentioning the ideas of, of analogies and concepts. You have said that we've made very little progress on these aspects of abstraction and analogy making and that not enough attention has been paid to them. Can you give me just a rundown of how you think about these aspects of abstraction, analogy making, their role in AI? Yeah, so so this goes back to my work with Douglas Hofstadter. Hofstadter's obsession is with analogies and abstraction. To him, analogy goes way beyond, say, the word analogies that we're all familiar with, like shoe is to foot as glove is to blank. So people have done looked at that, but analogies are much more subtle and much more rich. If you think about if someone describes a situation to you, like losing their luggage at the airport, that brings up all kinds of memories that have the kind of essence of that situation, even though they're quite different. You've sort of abstracted the essence of a particular situation. And we make analogies all the time unconsciously. Hofstadter and his colleague, uh, Emmanuel Sander, wrote this book called Surfaces and Essences, which is all about, it's like a big compendium of various ways in which people make analogies unconsciously. And it's just amazing once you start to notice it, how often it is. I remember uh, giving a talk about analogy and there was this guy who was in the audience who was very skeptical. And he said, you know, why are you always putting analogy in the driver's seat? And it's like, okay, you just made an analogy. <laughs> uh, you know, you didn't even notice it. So our, our language is full of that kind of thing. But anyway, the idea is that this is something that is very, turns out to be the, one of the easy things for us, but very difficult for machines. People have been working on this for decades, and we still don't have machines that can very generally make abstractions. In fact, you know, machine learning has this subfield called transfer learning, which is how do you take something you've learned in one domain and apply it in another domain? And it's very hard, but that's just another word for analogy in my mind. I have a lot to say on this. <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. sure where to begin. I think that this is one of the key problems for making AI systems that are not brittle, that can actually use knowledge that they have about one kind of situation and apply it to new situations. And I really like the uh, work of Cholet, Francois Cholet, on his abstraction and reasoning corpus. It's this very nice benchmark for abstraction that has to do with visual transformations of little colored grids. It's very rich domain. And nobody's been able to make much progress on it yet because exact, we haven't captured you know, the ability to make abstractions from a small number of, of examples. So it's few shot learning is the key abstraction is needed for that. And I think nobody knows how to get machines to do it. Yeah. I also have a few different things that are kind of coming to my mind here. Perhaps one is you've often referenced this quotation from Hofstadter that says, without analogies, there can be no concepts. And that seems to, before we even get into machines, just present a very interesting picture of the world and like how our, our cognition seems to engage with it, where analogies are kind of sitting at the forefront. Could you maybe just break down how that vision plays out for you? If everything really stems from analogies, the ways in which I kind of engage with the world, what that looks like. Yeah. So there's this word concept, right? Which is used throughout talking about intelligence and Oftentimes, I think in AI, people conflate the term concept with the term category. And they say, okay, like the ImageNet data set has a thousand concepts. You know, we have golden retriever, we have temple, we have coffee cup and all that. But a concept to me is something much richer than a category. And in fact, I really like a, another quotation from Lawrence Barcelou, who, a cognitive psychologist who said a concept having a concept is having the ability to generate infinite instantiations of a category. Here's an example. An example I often use in my talk is the concept of a bridge. 
you know, we think about the Golden Gate Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge or whatever. So we, we know what a bridge is, but we can take that concept and we can extend it infinitely. So I can talk about bridging the gender gap or the bridge of a song if you're into music, you know, the, and so you have the, these uh, metaphorical, in some sense, extensions of, of this category. And it's the collection of all of those potential instantiations of a, of a category that make up a concept. And it, so it's a concept is really, I think of it as not necessarily a thing sitting statically in your brain, but more as a model that can do generation, can, a generative model that can generate instantiations of things. That's really interesting. And I think that it connects to this analogizing because it's sort of this flexible thing that I can fit into all sorts of different situations. So you just set a bridge and I can make analogies to the types of bridges I've seen before. So as you said, bridge in a song, a physical bridge, many, many other things there. What I wonder though is when I start to think about a concept in this way where my cognizing of it, my grip on it is really dictated by the ways in which I analogize it to things I've experienced. Is there a place it bottoms out or is, is everything just, you know, this, this set of analogies that have kind of been collected <laughs> by experience? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. You know, I, I like the work of, say, George Lakoff, who looks at concepts as sort of bottoming out with f- basic physical experience. And this is also relates to work of people like uh, uh, Elizabeth Spelke, a cognitive psychologist who who looks at what she thinks of as the innate knowledge systems that babies are born with and that we base all of our concepts on. And so Lakoff talks about metaphor and he says, sort sort of the way that we think about things, abstract things like love or money or time is all based on metaphors to, um, physical experiences. And so we talk about falling in love, sort of this notion of falling or talk about time passing us by. So we sort of think about time as a physical thing that's passing and that that time goes backwards or forwards like a spatial system. And he and Mark Johnson have this great book called Metaphors We Live By, which goes into great detail about all of this. So I think that that's, you know, it's a great hypothesis that all of our concepts are basically bottom out in this basic physical experience, basic physical knowledge of the world that maybe we're born with, maybe we're, we learn, but are sort of primed by evolution to learn. So that that's a, a kind of a view I have sympathy with. And what it tells us is that maybe we should be looking to some of these ideas from developmental psychology to think about AI. And I think that some people are, in fact, that that's, that's now a really interesting approach to AI where we're looking at more deeply at how children learn. And it's a very different way than which our current machines learn. But maybe it has s- some insight into how to get machines to do few shot abstraction that's robust. Yeah, I can, I can see that physical aspect as being really useful and um, I hope you don't mind my spending so much time on these like very abstract questions, but just the views they imply are fascinating to me because the bottoming out in, in the physical really does feel to me like empiricism. And just when I think about the, the concept picture, um, I don't know, maybe I've been reading like too much Spinoza recently, but this kind of made me think about his like the nature of a thing is expressed in its definition and his whole metaphysical notion that there has to be some kind of bottoming out to explanation and that eventually as you go back to it there has to be something that is not understood in terms of analogy but has to be understandable cognizable in in terms of itself and so some of what you've been saying here just kind of brought that up for me and it feels like there's I mean, we don't really have answers to any of these like metaphysical questions and the nature of cognition. It's a very tricky debate, but it it does seem like there's kind of an interesting overlap here just in the ways we think about concepts and then how that intersects with some of these metaphysical views as well. Yeah. I mean, there's other views in cognitive science that are interesting too. Like Barcelo has this view that all concepts, you know, when we when we think about a concept or we reason about a concept, we're actually kind of reenacting a specific situated experience that we've had. That's kind of a representative of that concept. And 
that's possible and that, you know, the perception and cognition are much more closely related than people think. So I, I think that's, you know, one of the things that I have said in my talks is that I think understanding how to form concepts, what concepts are, how to form them, how to use them flexibly is like one of the key open issues in AI. And I don't think so many people, I, I feel like people use the term concept in a much shallower way than it should be used. And that's one of the problems. Yeah. With regard to approaches, I'd love to get into some of, of your work here. So you mentioned Cholet's ARC data set earlier, and I know that you have discussed various other approaches to looking at this question, like Raven's progressive matrices, and you mentioned the, the copycat architecture earlier in our conversation. Could you spend some time on, on how you've come to approach this question and perhaps what the copycat architecture is? Sure. So the first thing to say is that one way to approach these questions about abstraction and analogy is to try and idealize them, not just jump at real world behavior immediately, but to say, well, let, let's take some of the issues of abstraction, like learning this sort of more rich concept and being able to use it in different situations. Let's make that more abstract. So that's been being done for a really long time. The thing that I heard about first was the what are called the Bongard problems, which are the set of visual puzzles created in the 1960s by Bongard, a Russian computer scientist who was looking at neural networks. Hofstetter wrote about this in Gertel Escher Bach. And he, you know, one of his goals was to build a machine that could solve these problems. But then he decided that th this was too difficult, that he needed to idealize it even more. So he came up with this letter string analogy domain that has now been called the copycat domain, where it has problems that are tra transformations between letter strings like ABC changes to ABD. What does PQRS change to? You know, and there's no correct answer, right? Because you could say it changes to D, the last letter in the string changes to D, or it changes to ABD, anything changes to ABD, you know, being very literal. But most people will say it changes, you know, ABC to ABD, PQRS to PQRT. They'll take a more abstract view of what happened. And Hofstadter and his um, students, and then when I joined the group a little bit later, me as well, just created thousands and thousands of these letter string problems. It's, it seems like a really simple domain, but it's incredibly open-ended and richer than you might think. And my PhD project was creating a computer program that could solve these problems. And it was called Copycat. It was more sim of a symbolic kind of system. And I think it was limited in ways that symbolic AI is limited, but it had some interesting ideas. Cholet, much later, was not aware of Copycat or Bongard problems, I think. And he created his own version of this, which is uh, his ARC corpus, but it has a lot of the same flavor to it. And, you know, these things are still challenges for AI. I think, you know, a, a good and important question is like, if, if a program could solve these, how could it be extended to the real, real world analogies and abstractions? And I think that's still a, an open question, but I, I do think it's a promising way to, to approach these, these issues. Yeah, it, it does seem like there's a good amount of discourse on, on pushing back perhaps and I suppose, reviving some of the ideas that people were having when symbolic AI was much more of a thing. At the same time, I suppose there are also blends of approaches. We've seen neurosymbolic AI, and I know that you have looked at various different approaches people are trying to take that include symbolic systems and, and neural networks. Are there any particular paths that people are taking right now that to you perhaps feel feel more promising than the others that you've looked at? I've been looking deeply into the, what's called um, probabilistic program induction, which is a uh, idea to, if you're given a, a, some kind of abstraction problem or new situation to represent the concept as a program. This is work like done by um, Josh Tenenbaum and Brendan Lake and many other people. The idea is that you have some set of primitives. This is your built-in 
knowledge, which are in the form of sort of program primitives in some domain specific language. And then your task as a program induction system is to given a new situation to create a program that will allow you to answer a question or deal with the situation. The problem with it is it's very, you know, it's very compute intensive. It, it uses a lot of expensive search. And now people are looking at speeding it up using neural networks to help speed up the search sort of in the way that they were used in uh, deep reinforcement learning with uh, Monte Carlo search. And I, yeah, I'm fascinated by that. But to me, you know, one of the problems with neural nets and this program induction approach is it's not very dynamic. Neural networks are feed forward. They don't have, for the most part, the kind of feedback that we humans bring uh, when we're sort of trying to make sense of a situation, this kind of dynamic quality of our thinking. And the same thing with this program induction stuff. So I'm interested in how you would in, in, in use some kind of more feedback centered dynamic system to do these kinds of things. Yeah. As a closing out question, I think that you have a very interesting and important perspective just on what AI should be going for, what it is based off of your experiences. And I think there are many people today who are asking questions about if I want to get into AI, if I want to do research in this field, what are the problems I should be thinking about? What foundational knowledge should I have? What should I be studying? And there are many, many strong opinions on this. As somebody who has done so many important things in the field, I'd love to hear your advice on somebody who is perhaps starting out their career or just thinking about how do I make an impact on this field? How do I chase after meaningful, important questions? What advice could you leave to that person in terms of what to study, how to go about doing research, how to pick important problems? Yeah, this is a great question. I It's difficult to answer because, you know, AI is so broad, but there is this perception in the field, I think, that a lot of big problems have been solved, which I think is not true at all, that you can't do anything unless you have some huge compute resource, which very few people in academia have, you know, I think these are wrong, that there are big questions that uh, people can make progress on. I think it really depends on your interests, but there's been so much work on deep learning and with so little sort of science behind it. So, so little sort of understanding of why deep learning might work the way it does, what its limitations might be, how language models work, how they do what they do. You know, these are all things that can be done, can be probed, can be studied without huge compute resources, I think, and are still big open questions. And, you know, this whole question of few shot learning and abstraction and analogy, I think is still wide open. So I do think there are a lot of wide open questions. What you should do to prepare yourself? Well, have a good background in not only coding, but in mathematics, probability and statistics, really important. Linear algebra, obviously really important. And to read, to read a lot, read papers, read uh, books, get a lot of different views, read about the history of the field. I think so few people who are in the field now have much of a perspective on the history and what's been done before, which is really too bad. And they should absolutely also read your papers because I think that you provide such important perspective. Well, Melanie, you're such an incredible, thoughtful person. I, I want to thank you for all of the work you're doing. It's just really important to have a voice like yours. And I appreciate that work. And I appreciate the time you spent talking with me today. Well, thank you so much. It's been a really great conversation. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. 
If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.